30, so I think we can get started. Uh, I do want to welcome everybody to uh, this year's Spruce uh, Almost Heaven Star Party, our 14th year. This is our second speaker. Uh, Dave Dvorkin spoke last night. Cal Powell is a, is a member of NOVAC. He's been a member since 2010, since he moved to the area. He's an experienced amateur. <coughs> Excuse me. He previously was president of the Westport, Connecticut uh, Astronomical. Astron Astronomical Society. Um, if you ever get a chance to visit their science center and their observatory, it's, it's quite outstanding. I'm not sure if they have public programs at the observatory anymore, but... Well, they have an observatory uh, yeah. it's called the Rolnick, well, it used to be called the Rolnick Observatory in Westport. Yeah. So that's, that's, quite, an, uh, that's quite an establishment. Now, uh, now Cal, who's retired, volunteers with the Analemma Society and the, the Roll Top Observatory in Fairfax County, and he's a volunteer uh, instructor, public outreach person at the uh, Smithsonian Institution, in addition to all the great work he does and the, and the talks he gives to Novak and all the support he gives us. So please welcome Cal Powell, who will be speaking about meteorites. Thank you very much, Alan. It's great to see so many people here bushy-eyed and bright-tailed this morning. And uh, you know, when I thought of a title, I was thinking of, uh, anybody watch the late show with Stephen Colbert and how he likes to confess? And uh, so uh, I thought that maybe I'd have a, a confessions presentation too. What I'd like to do is run through uh, a brief information on technology, uh, terminology for meteorites as well as uh, meteorite types, and then uh, mention some things about uh, how they get to market and some tips for the collector and or buyer. So does that sound fairly interesting to folks? Excellent. So uh, I was like a, a humorous slide at the start, and this one kind of cracks me up because I get the visual impression of some great tarp that has to roll back at 8 a.m. I think it's just the, s the road that's closed. I'm not sure if it's a, uh, a opposed thing or a natural thing, so I'll just uh, uh, say that uh, no uh, lizards were harmed in the <laughs> preparation of the slide. A little bit about the language. So we have these things that are run around the uh, solar system called meteoroids, small solar system body. Now, if one of these things hits our atmosphere and glows due to the friction of passing through the air, then we call it a meteor. And once it lands on Earth or maybe somewhere else, uh, it's called a meteorite. And I have a nice uh, animated GIF that shows the relationship of those three terms. So we'll be talking about meteorites. So if you see one and you actually are lucky enough to find a piece, it's called a fall. Pretty technical. Uh, all the other ones are called finds. And most meteorites are named for the closest uh, entity uh, to which they were found. It could be a town, it could be a county, it could be a geographic feature. And so for those that can read Kyrillic, that's Chelyabinsk. You might have heard of that one. It fell over Russia about five and a half years ago. Now, if multiple unrelated meteorites are found in the same locale, a letter in parentheses or a number uh, can be applied. And the number for some Sahara and some Antarctic meteorites will contain the year of discovery as the first two digits. Most meteorites are pieces of asteroids and they are older than any earth rock. I do have here a piece of Acasta Nice. It's a nice piece of rock. It's early in the morning, that's okay. 
And uh, this is uh, part of arguably the oldest rock on Earth. Everything on Earth, of course, has been recycled in one way, shape, or form, pretty much. And so it's rare to find a piece of unrecycled rock. This is about four billion years old. Most meteorites are 4.3 to 4.5 billion years old. However, some meteorites were blasted off the surface of the Moon or Mars. And I have a couple of those up front here, too. And by the way, after my talk, uh, feel free to come up and have a personal moment with any of these uh, uh, specimens from my collection up here. Classification. Now, just to make things simple, there are multiple classification systems. The older one and uh, simpler one is based on the structure or physical appearance of the meteorite. And uh, it's certainly easier to apply by just looking at it. Uh, but the newer one utilizes chemical properties. And so that's a bit trickier. And it aids to group by the originating body. However, just to make things even easier, hybrid classification schemes are common. So. That's one of the reasons I recommend to read a good book before getting into this stuff if you want to get into it because uh, it'll be very helpful in your knowledge. Simple classification, real simple. Stony, iron, and wait for it, stony iron. <laughs> That's about as simple as you can get, but when we talk about stony, we have to talk about these things called chondrules. And I probably should turn off my radio. Done. Chondrules are these spherical inclusions in meteorites. They're little round grains and they're formed from droplets of material that sol solidified in the early solar system. These are some of the earliest stuff that turns solid in our, uh, our neck of the solar system. And so stony meteorites that contain these chondrules are called chondrites. Now, for those of you who uh, went to uh, Geology 201, I'll just say that technically chondrites are meteorites that mirror the non-volatile composition of the sun. So not all of them have chondrules, but they can still be considered a chondrite. And then everything else is called an achondrite. And chondrites are the most numerous type of meteorite. About 86% of them are chondrites. And so I'll just go briefly over a few types. Ordinary, carbonaceous, which are those guys that formed uh, from ast uh, came from asteroids that formed closer to the Jupiter side of the asteroid belt rather than the Mars side of the asteroid belt, so that there is a chance of their forming in the presence of some liquid water. That means they contain maybe some oxides or carbonates in them and usually not so much in the way of bare metal. Then there are other types of rarer types of chondrites called enstatites, rumorudiites, and a small subgroup called cacangariites. I don't have a cacangariite, so, uh, but I've got representatives of the other two types here as well. Uh, they're a little bit different in chemical makeup. And there's, a, um, uh, there's an order that they were formed within the, s or they believe that there's an order closeness to the sun that they formed in the solar system. And so uh, I think that might be one of my hidden slides here because I've got uh, more than 100 slides in this deck, most of which, or a lot of which are hidden. Uh, CAIs. 
we have lots of TLAs here, three-letter ac acronyms. These are calcium aluminum rich inclusions, and they may be the very first solids that formed in the protoplanetary disk around the sun. And the oldest has been dated to a little over 4.5 billion years ago, give or take a few tens of millions. And they're usually light colored and irregular in shape. So here's an early morning test. Can you find the CAI in that meteorite? <laughs> yeah, this is uh, these guys, yep. And these other, these other guys are chondrules here. No, carbon dating is much too, 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 too brief, too, re too recent. It's usually um, uh, uranium, lead, uh, strontium, rubidium. So there are a number of different uh, markers they use. And uh, uh, that's not my strength, but that I can tell you that's probably a uh, good 15 minute to half hour lecture on how they do that but they essentially plot uh, various ratios of isotopes and where the slope hits the, uh, crosses the line is their best guess at the date. Meteoritic metal, Mo many meteorites, including stony meteorites, contain metal. And most of the metal is a mixture of iron and nickel. And usually when young people are in the room, I say, how many young people really know what this thing is? <laughs> how many, how many, how, okay, how many of the uh, smartphone set know what this is then? <laughs> and the, the old name for this stuff, uh, mixture of iron and nickel is called siderite. So iron and nickel, of course, are most common magnetic elements. Iron, nickel, and cobalt are the, the big three in magnetic. And a process called differenti differentiation, easy for me to say this morning, results in most of the metals accumulating in the core of an asteroid that's big enough to have enough internal heating to start melting stuff. And so the iron and nickel sinks into the core and the less dense rock rises. And I believe metal meteorites provided the first clue that the Earth has a metal core. Now, of course, it took seismology to actually find where that was, but uh, considering that the farthest down we've gone is maybe, what, three, five, five miles, maybe, uh, and uh, the core is, uh, I don't know, what is it, 1,500 miles down? So, yeah. Uh, so the metal meteorite said, hey, uh, this process really is real, and uh, metal does accumulate in the cores of bodies that are a certain size. Iron and nickel can combine to form alloys, metallic minerals, and the two important ones are tyanite, which is iron mixed with about 20 to 65 percent nickel, and camisite which has less nickel. And so those two guys, under slow cooling conditions, can separate out and form uh, precipitates of one on the octahedral planes of the other. And so those, the precipitate results in a distinctive, easy for me to say, Widmanstetten pattern. You can say Thompson structure and be just as correct, but that's either one. And when the sample is sliced, polished, and then etched with a weak acid. And the weak acid brings out the structure because they have different, uh, they dissolve at different points in the solution. This is the subsequent remelting through, uh, by passage through the atmosphere, not the initial melting. Right, and this is the initial melting. In other words, w initial cooling, I should say, the initial cooling. So what happens is, you know, when you, the cooling over a few degrees every million years, and that's how slowly the cooling has to occur for this crystal structure to occur. 
which is why it is unique to asteroid size objects. We don't have that time here on Earth. Everything is either one way or the other. There are some meteorites that may have started this way and melted due to impact and other, you know, thermal energy. And uh, there are also meteorites that don't have any structure because they have too much nickel or something like that. And so uh, those are called ataxites. And uh, there are not quite as many of those as they are of, of these type. But yeah, this is very slow cooling over long periods of time. And depending on how it's sliced, depending uh, in oriented to where the crystal structures are, uh, you get different types of patterns. And uh, you can see a fairly nice sample in this one up I have up here, where they've also left the outer edge uh, unetched to show what it would look like if it were just polished. They have a name for the bands. They're called lamellae. And lamellae patterns are graded coarsest to finest. Then we'll talk about the mixtures briefly. You've got palisites. I've got one here called spring water, which comes from Canada. These are iron meteorites with embedded olivine crystals. Olivine is a common mineral here on Earth. And when it's in gem quality here on Earth, we give it a fancy name, peridot. And it's also the August birthstone. And so these are named not after the asteroid or the Greek goddess or anything like that. It's named after a person, Peter Pallas. And they're arguably the most beautiful meteorites, and many of them are priced like that. And then mesosiderites, which roughly means sort of half iron and half stone. And that's a fairly uh, uncommon type too. The one I have here is called Esterville, which is from Iowa. And my small sample actually has mostly metal. So you could confuse it for a metal meteorite. So I'm going to just run through these very briefly. You can see the different types of classification. This is the simple stony, stony irons, irons. Stony chondrites and achondrites. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Most of the books will say achondrites are a part of the stony family. However, uh, if you include the chemical classification, they have some metallic ones that show up as achondrites or primitive achondrites. And so, uh, Again, there's no real consensus among meteoriticists about this stuff. Stony irons, palisites, and mesosiderites. And irons, depending on the crystal structure, hexahedrites, octahedrites, and ataxites. And then they, of course, uh, rate the octahedrites based on the patterns that they see from coarsest to uh, finest. And placidic is you have to use a microscope to see the structure. The newer classification uses proportions of trace elements, gallium, germanium, and iridium, to nickel, and then they sort of do a cluster analysis and come up with different groups. So you've got four groups and up to seven subgroups, and they kind of point to distinct asteroids or families of asteroids. But when it comes down to it, still about 15% of iron meteorites are ungrouped. So there's other. And for the more... Uh, complicated classification, you have undifferentiated meteorites, which is where your chondrites are, your differentiated meteorites, where your achondrites are, and then you've got sort of partially differentiated guys. And so those show up are called primitive achondrites. And just running through chondrites we've talked about before. And for ordinaries, there are brought three main groups, high metal, or high iron, low iron, and low metal. Carbonaceous chondrites, they have so many different types, a bunch of, they have them grouped as clans. And the, uh, most of the initials after the C, which is for carbonaceous, 
uh, talks about the uh, the type specimen, the first or most prominent uh, specimen that that particular type was uh, devised from. So they name like Ivuna and Renazzo and Ben Cubbin and that kind of stuff. Enstatites uh, are back with H's and L's for high and low metal. And primitive achondrites have a bunch of different types, including uh, these guys here. When you see them beginning with Roman numerals, those are the metals. And so these are show up as parts of primitive achondrites, metal meteorites that came from asteroids that didn't quite make it fully through the differentiation process. And there are a whole bit, a bunch of achondrites, uh, including, uh, and I put it in quotes here because these are most of the irons, uh, the HED stand for Howardites, Eukrites, and Diogenites, and I've got one of each of those here because those are ones that are fairly sure they come from the asteroid Vesta. So you can actually see something in the sky tonight and say a piece of that is known to be here. And also I have uh, one Martian uh, sample, uh, one lunar sample, and one Martian speck up here. Some statistics. Again, this shows you how, you know, if you take all the meteorites that are in the official meteorite database, uh, the vast majority are stony. And then you can see that iron makes up uh, maybe in the North America, maybe 20, uh, almost a quarter, but every place else it is uh, less than 5%. And then everything else is a very thin slice. Uh, probably because they're easier to uh, recognize here, you know, when the, to find meteorites, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, you have to know what's common and what's uncommon for where you are. And chances are, unless there is a, uh, a smelter down the street from you or whatever, that uh, uh, if you find something that's a, a hunk of iron, good chance that it might be a meteorite. And then for stony meteorites, they, they break off, and you can see how, again, the vast majority are ordinary. And uh, then out of, you've got some carbonaceous, and then you've got a small chunk that are other stuff. A little more language for getting now closer to the, those who are interested in buying and collecting. A specimen, of course, is an item of meteoritic or uh, related origin. Clast is a fragment of stone contained in a larger stone specimen. And brescia is a stone that consists mostly of clasts. Individual is a complete meteorite, like this JHO20 I've got up here. Fragment is a broken off piece of an individual. A window is where you take an individual and you slice off a piece so you can see some of the insides. A full slice is a complete slice of an individual. Both sides are just one side. Uh, it's a full slice, so it's, in other words, uh, well, a shiny is another, it's a polishing process that makes it that way. So it, it can be shiny on both sides. It, can, it depends on how it's been processed. A part slice is when you take a full slice and cut it up. And an end slice is a slice where one side is the outside of the meteorite. So again, if you're looking at you know, descriptions of specimens, it's important to know the difference between these types. Talk a little bit about the processing. How does it get from farm to market? Uh, and again, this is for many types, not every type, but nomadic peoples are, know that there's a big market for these things now, and so they'll look for s anomalous stones in the desert. Then they are sold to middlemen, and there may be several hierarchies of middlemen in a marketplace, and eventually they are then sold to dealers and collectors. 
So if it's thought to be a newer uncommon specimen, the main mass owner, the person who bought that hunk of uh, meteorite, will send a sample to a lab for analysis and classification. And then the resulting information can then be submitted to the Nomenclature Committee, or NOMCOM, of the Meteoritical Society for official naming and certification. They'll, they can bless it, or they cannot. And then, depending on the projected value, the owner may slice and dice it for sale. Oh, by the way, anybody notice the centimeter cube here? A lot of uh, photos you'll see have those centimeter cubes. And uh, they're very adept at taking nice high-resolution photos of large photos of centimeter cubes. I have one here. You can see a centimeter cube isn't very big. Is that the most affordable thing in your collection? <laughs> Ooh. Actually, it might be the meteor wrong, but I'll go there. <laughs> oh. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about value since you brought it up. And so, as with any commodity, the value of a particular specimen is based on supply and demand. And meteorite specimens are usually priced per gram. So I'll give you a rough price ranges per gram. And again, your mileage may vary. So these are rough. You have inexpensive meteorites uh, that are less than $20 a gram. And I'll give you some names there. Intermediate are from about $20 to $100 a gram. Expensive are about a hundred to a thousand dollars a gram, and then I have one more category which I call astronomical, <laughs> and those are for the real rarities, rarities that you know, they're not going to find too many more of. And uh, when you think of uh, the prices of these things, and you know they are pretty pricey, but let me ask a question. How much does a one carat diamond cost? Anybody have thousand dollars? Okay, so that is five thousand dollars a gram, and that would be in the astronomical group. And as common as diamonds are, true. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, a historical fall is, for example, uh, s something that's been f fallen and special. Either it's an early meteorite that's seen to uh, have fallen and have been documented. For example, there's one called Ensisheim, which fell in 1492. And if not the earliest, it's one of the very earliest uh, accurately dated and documented falls of a meteorite. And so that's a historical fall. Or you can consider uh, certain other ones like, for example, Peekskill, which was seen by one of our attendees here. Uh, and it actually fell through a, the trunk of a car in uh, Westchester County. And so I've got a small piece of that here. That could be considered a historical fall. Specific event. A, yeah, a specific event, and it's seen to have fallen. <laughs> Which one here? Now we're talking <laughs> Chelyabinsk. Yeah. yeah, I was. I used to say Chelyabinsk, and then a Russian speaker corrected me at like. Uh, uh, Astronomy Day or Stargaze a little while ago. So the accents on the second syllable, Chelyabinsk. And uh, yeah, well that one, uh, it blew up as an airburst and pieces scattered all over a relatively populated area. And so it was, it was all over the internet and people went nuts finding pieces of those. And so those came onto the market fairly quickly. No. No, a lot did fall on 
icy places because it fell on uh, uh, St. Valentine's Day, I believe, in 2013. And uh, you might consider that a possible historic fall too. But usually it's the, the old ones, you know, very early ones, the first one to have been uh, documented and fallen, say, in the Czech Republic or something like that. So there's some desirable attributes to look for. Weight, obviously, the, the more grams, the uh, more uh, it'll cost. Uh, what's considered beauty is things like palisite slices are considered attractive, so that adds to the value. A historical, we just spoke about historical. Crusted. So, if a meteorite comes hypersonically through the atmosphere, what happens to the outside? It gets hot. It gets so hot that it can melt and form a sort of thin layer, a glassy layer on the outside of the meteorite. That's called the crust. And so the, I have a uh, Chelyabinsk, Chelyabinsk specimen that's crusted and also oriented. You can tell which direction it went in. So those are all desirable attributes. Specialty, and there are different types, whether a hammer is what they call a, a meteorite that either hits somebody or hits something. <laughs> uh, some people just collect falls or witness falls or whatever. Yeah, uh, that uh, hasn't been documented to happen to anyone yet, but uh, it could happen. But rarity, for example, lunar or Martian, and variable, very desirable specimens are labeled museum quality. How many Martian meteors are there? I mean, how many, what's there? A few hundred. Yeah. Now, there are some things that aren't meteorites but are related, so I call them meteorite relatives. So there are these things called tektites, and they're the glacial, glassy terrestrial debris from meteorite impacts. And so I've got a couple of those here. I've got a, uh, a bicolite, or a bicolite, which is from the Philippines, and uh, also a uh, moldavite, which is from the uh, Czech Republic. Uh, this is a little bit glassier looking and greener, and the uh, moldavites are much sought after for jewelry. There are impactites, which is earth rock that's been crushed and compacted due to meteoritic impact. And I have an example of suavite from Germany. And uh, again, it sort of forms almost like a natural concrete. And it's what it really reminds you of when you look at this stuff. And even before people knew what it was, they, used, they quarried it and used it for construction. Na natural glass. What I'm calling natural glass here in the meteorite context are the melt product resulted from an atmospheric meteorite explosion. And that's believed to have happened over the desert in western Egypt, eastern Libya, and forms this stuff called Libyan desert glass. This has been, of course, uh, cut and polished, but uh, there is a, I have a LED light here, and it'll show that if you look through it, you'll actually see the little pieces of the whatever blew up that are contained inside it. And this has been known, this sort of, this stuff has been known since ancient times because there is actually an example of a carved piece of this on uh, King Tutankhamun's brooch. Uh, there's a, a large scarab beetle carved out of this stuff. So it was known as then at least as pretty special stuff. And impact sediment, sedimentary rock that contains evidence of a meteorite impact, like the KT boundary. Who's heard of the KT boundary? And uh, if anybody knows who wishes they hadn't heard of the KT boundary? Dinosaurs, yeah? <laughs> okay. But anyway, uh, this is a sample of the KT boundary material from Gubbio, Italy, which is where 
it was first discovered that this layer of clay, and you can see it uh, as the sort of orangey brownish uh, rock here, contained high, relatively high levels of iridium, which is in the parts per billion in normal earth rocks, but parts per million in this stuff. And so uh, that uh, was dated back to 65 million years ago, and they found it now all over the world. And they even found the source of where the landing was, which is in the Yucatan Peninsula, a place called Chicxulub. And this is just a diagram to show that tektites can have many forms depending on how big uh, the s splash p piece was and how far away it landed. Collecting meteorites. So you can collect via specialties. You can be a type collector. I want to get one of every type. Uh, and you have to have deep pockets to really do a good job on that. Collect historical ones. Witnessed falls. Hammers. There goes Mrs. Hodges. And that's uh, another uh, expensive one, Silicauga, which is was Alabama. Thin sections. That's for the real geologists. And it's called, it's, to me, it's sort of like stained glass sci uh, science, where you can really understand the mineral content of a meteorite by uh, taking a very thin slice and polishing it down to the point where it's trans nearly transparent, and then you shine either regular or polarized light through it, and you can see a different mineral content. And so that's something I haven't been interested in, but there are a number of people who do that, especially the, uh, the real geology types. Uh, you can collect from a given geographic area. And if you like to do this sort of thing, you can collect for outreach. Acquiring. You can go hunt for meteorites. That's not my thing, but you hear some things to be aware of. You've got to be aware of, do you have permissions to do that, wherever you're going to do it. There is certain equipment that it helps to have, like a, a strong uh, magnet, maybe metal detector. You have to know what's common for the area, and then to figure out what's an anomalous stone. Uh, would be a potential for a meteorite. And those, not, uh, if it's, uh, it might look like a meteorite, but it still might not be, could be what's called a meteor wrong. And I've got one here, which we believe is a piece of slag, but it could fool someone to thinking that it might be a meteorite. You have to know who owns this stuff if you find it, local ownership laws. And if you go to foreign lands to look at these things, you've got to know things about transport and export regulations. And guess where most meteorites are found anyway? Antarctica. The thing about Antarctica, though, is by treaty, meteorites that are found in Antarctica are to be used for uh, scientific purposes only. So there are very few Antarctic meteorites that end up in the marketplace. But a lot of them are found in North Africa, and specifically a lot of them will be labeled as NWA for Northwest Africa. Uh, and for its size, the country of Oman has a great number of meteorites. Don't know why. Then you can go to gem, mineral, or fossil shows. There is a uh, fall show that meets at, uh, or it's held at George Mason University. And so I've been to uh, like two or three of those. And that's, they have, although it's, it's certainly uh, gem and mineral, uh, most of their uh, exhibits uh, or sellers are selling that sort of stuff. There are a few sellers there that will sell uh, meteorites. And then, our favorite, the internet. So getting started, what I would recommend is buy and read a good meteorite book, like the Field Guide to Meteors and Meteorites, and that is uh, part of the uh, uh, Patrick 
Moore's Practical Astronomy series. Oh, that's by Richard Norton. Oh, Richard Norton and Larry uh, Chitwood. Uh, and uh, the late O. Richard Norton, by the way, I believe. Uh, and his uh, uh, widow co-wrote with him one for younger uh, readers called What's So Mysterious About Meteorites? And so again, it's got uh, Richard or, and Dorothy Sigler Norton as the authors here. Anyway, select a few inexpensive specimens to start to determine what you like. And if you're doing buying online, look for sellers who display the International Meteorite Collectors Association membership uh, symbol. It's sort of like uh, similar to the good housekeeping seal of approval for meteorites in that uh, uh, these people guarantee the authenticity and if you get something from somebody who has that seal and it's found to be not real, you have some recourse. Oh, they certainly do. I'll talk a little bit about that. And then always, always, always check the Meteoritical Bolton database before each purchase. And I'll tell you why as we'll go along here. So there's some yellow flags. For example, if it's not in the meteoritical database, that means it hasn't gone through the process. It might not even have started to go through the process yet to be official. It hasn't been, there's no name that's been associated with this meteorite. The seller's not saying, it just says, the seller's saying meteorite or meteorite from Russia. It could be rock from Russia for all you know, earth rock. Provisional, that means it's sort of a temporary name and it hasn't officially gotten its official name yet. Unclassified. Hasn't even been classified by a lab to say what it really is. So these are things just saying, keep these sorts of things in mind if you see them in online ads. Under classification, again, it's, within, it's in the process. It says NWA XXX or just NWA without a number. Guess what? This hasn't been classified either. And the name is in quotes. If the name is in quotes, then the chances are it's a provisional name or a working name that the seller has given it. It's not official. More yellow flags. There's no classification specified. Again, most uh, sellers will sell, tell you the classification up front or at least somewhere within their uh, specimen description. If it's not specified, kind of beware. No weight specified means you don't know how really big or small it is. And there are lots of tricks where they can make small meteorites look pretty big. If you remember that scale cube. Classification is mismatched. The seller says it's one thing but the database says it's another thing. There are a few cases where that can be legitimate. In a few cases, it was classified, but classified incorrectly. And then the uh, classifier said, wait, I made a mistake. It's really something else. But the database hasn't made the change yet, or maybe they're not going to make the change. But in any case, uh, I would, again, tend to stay away from, from those uh, meteorites that don't match the classification in the database. If you see a tektite, something like an Indochinite or Australite or a Philippinite or something like that, but they don't call it a tektite, they just call it a meteorite. Watch out. Confusing or unfocused image. You know, for very small specimens, they might have a hard time getting it in focus and they're just putting it up for sale anyway. So that might be a very small uh, uh, specimen. Or they might put it against a background that has a pattern to it or something else, which is, makes it hard to see the meteorite based on its, uh, its appearance totally. Yes, John? When you said name, you mean like names like tektite or do you mean like chayabin? 
Uh, oh, if it's not named, yeah, if it, if it, it, it doesn't have a name like uh, Chelyabinsk or something like that. Yeah. yeah. If there's no image at all, then definitely buyer beware. Uh, sometimes they'll be honest and say this is native iron. It means that it's actually naturally occurring iron here on Earth as opposed to from a meteorite. And sometimes they'll even admit it's a meteor wrong. And there might be people that might collect these meteor wrongs, you know, but again, it's not a meteorite. Still more yellow flags. It's a mounted specimen. I've got one of Chelyabinsk here. It's mounted in a nice marketing enclosure. And when you open this up, you find out that this specimen is actually glued to the backing. So uh, if you want to check it out more thoroughly, you're limited with that. So watch out for mounted. Sometimes they'll be mounted on a uh, fixed mounting as well. And so I'd stay clear of those. Specimen with pre-printed backing. And again, that's the same thing for this. Chances are it's pretty small. And again, chances are it's pasted to the back. A paired meteorite. Now sometimes uh, a uh, a meteorite is provisional, or it hasn't been fully uh, checked out, but it has what looks like an official name, and then they'll say it's paired to a real meteorite, because it's the seller's belief that it is just like one that's already been classified. So it might be okay, it might not. So again, watch out for the words paired, or the word paired. If it's shale or oxide or oxidite, for large metal meteorites, uh, the outside, that's been, if they've been on the Earth for quite a while, the outside will get rusted. And it might be, on the, might be around for so long that it might get rusted and compacted. And so that's termed to be either oxide or shale. So it is a real meteorite, but it doesn't retain the characteristics that the meteorite initially had, or that it might have further into the piece that fell on the Earth. So just be aware that's what you're getting there, as opposed to the real deal. John? Yeah, right, that's what I'm saying. Uh, if it's a, from an impact crater or impactite, again, that's interesting stuff, but it's not a meteorite. If the weight is given in ounces, milligrams, or carats. Okay, if the weight is given in ounces, it means that they don't know much about selling meteorites because most meteorites are sold by grams. If it's, if it's given in milligrams, guess what? It's going to be small because they'll just say milligrams to bump up the number. And so chances are what you're going to be buying then is a spec, something like this Mars rock here which is two, count them, two whole milligrams. <coughs> and if there are spiritual terms to, in the description, that it's lucky or powerful or whatever, well, what that tells you, like what, what, what carrots would tell you, by the way, is that the target uh, buyer is into jewelry, or spiritualism or something, and so the price is going to be jacked up for that uh, target buyer. Yet even more yellow flags. <laughs> Again, very small specimens, like these specks, you know, so you've got, uh, if, you're, if you're buying a stony meteorite, you probably don't want to buy anything that's less than a tenth of a gram. If it's iron, you don't want to buy anything that's less than a gram because it'll be pretty, pretty small. Specimen is in the vial. If it's in a vial, it means it's really small. So watch out. If it's a micro or a speck, just think two milligrams. Al, can this yes. Even be classified? 
Yeah, they they come they they can be classified, and again, the the real rare historical ones sometimes are in in vials, but again, you'll pay up for that. And again, so if you if you if that's what I'm not saying not to buy anything that has these characteristics. What I'm saying is, if you're starting out, be aware, make sure that's what you want. If it's a classified in a vial, that's okay, but it's still going to be small. And you're not going to be able to examine it the way you might want to examine something else that's a slice or, or what have you. So you just be able to say you've got something. I got something, yeah. You're not going to be able to show people right, yeah. Oh, I've got, yeah. I mean, sometimes people sell, uh, you know, moon dust, Mars dust, uh, shavings, you know, whatever, uh, that, uh, from when they've cut metal meteorites. And so you might find them in vials, that sort of thing. Rust on a polished or etched iron. Guess what? That rust isn't going to get any better in your, pos your possession. So again, uh, I would uh, just keep that in mind. Seller from a country with enhanced scrutiny. There are, you know, when you have all this talk about uh, trade tariffs and all this sort of stuff, if you're buying from a foreign seller, uh, things usually have to pass through customs or something like that. And so at the very least, that will delay your receiving the item. And if they are, you know, again, from a place that might uh, be in the news for enhanced scrutiny, you might want to think twice about that if you can get the same thing from a domestic seller. The seller is not a member of the International Meteorite Collectors Association. I mentioned that in the past. And if the shipping charges look really, really high. Uh, again, uh, sometimes uh, I've seen things come out of Canada with pretty high shipping charges. Now, maybe that's their postal service, but I don't know that. And again, if I can get something that is domestic or at least from some place where it's a reasonable shipping charge, uh, you know, between 5 or $10 as opposed to more than $20, I will tend to go that way. So, there are things that will put a premium on buying. Historical, if it's the main mass, the largest extant piece of a particular meteorite, that'll cost you, big time. If it's the type specimen, again, the first or defining specimen of a given type of meteorite, those cost a lot. If it's a rare classification, the meteorite uh, database can tell you how many uh, meteorites are classified in that particular classification. If it's got a low total known weight, that can bump up the price. Some meteorites like uh, Campo del Cielo, there are tons of this stuff available. Other things, there are only uh, maybe a couple tens of grams of it available. If it's got a famous collection provenance, for example, from a uh, university collection or something like that. Uh, it'll bump up the price. If it's a new fall or recent publicity, that will tend to jack up the price. And if it is carved into a sphere or a cube or some other fancy shape, that will jack up the price as well because it's more effort to do that. And finally, if it comes from a rare location, that will also make things more expensive. And if there's high craft or jewelry demand. Think about storage and display. So they're expensive, but they look nice, caliper stands. Riker mounts, those are these mounts fairly affordable and they provide decent protection for your stuff. They're held together with pins. So that's why I carry a pin cushion. <laughs> Membrane boxes are excellent if you can get them in the right size. Uh, it's for the small items, of course, you get these one inch by one inch ones. And they run for about three dollars each or so and they provide very good protection and you can see the entire specimen all the way around. 
And then there are various easel stands to complement those things. And I have uh, uh, one of those here, easel stand. And of course, no good collection would be uh, without a nice display cabinet. This is critical to do labeling and record keeping. And if why? Because if you start amassing these things, pretty soon one specimen might look like another one. And so you get help avoid confusion, and it helps to document your collection. Uh, you want to photograph every specimen. I happen to photograph specimens between uh, George and Franklin there. And that gives you a sense of size as well. And it gets, it's a, your own personal record of it. Uh, I also weigh every specimen just to make sure that I've got the proper weight which I purchased. Uh, you can buy relatively inexpensive uh, tenth of a gram scales uh, to do that. And again, that's all part of the things you document. And you want to document using a spreadsheet and or a database. I happen to use uh, both, and including uh, for database, uh, there is a free database called Data Crow, which you can sort of modify for any type of collection you might want to uh, make. So I've got my own modifications for meteorites. And be mindful of insurance considerations. Some care and maintenance. You've got to watch out for humidity control. You'll see some of these guys have silica gel in them. That helps hopefully prevent rust. Uh, you might have to learn how to uh, treat rust as well. I don't have any good suggestions there uh, uh, other than maybe alcohol uh, as well as uh, perhaps some gun oil or something like that to coat it. And be careful with friable specimens. That's, those are specimens that tend to crumble easily, uh, like this uh, Gubbio KT boundary material. This crumbles pretty easily. So you want to really uh, handle those with uh, as few times as possible and put them in a, uh, a membrane box or something like that. For outreach, they appeal to all ages. Every meteorite tells a story. And it's great activity when observing isn't possible. <laughs> I would recommend using relatively large specimens that can tolerate rough handling, especially from young children. Do not give young children more than one specimen to handle. Anybody know why that is? What do they do when they have two specimens? And keep your more delicate specimens in membrane boxes or other protective shells. And bring things like flashlights, magnets, and magnifying lenses for use by audience members. So I've got some magnets up here, and I actually have some uh, magnifying lenses with built-in LEDs. Don't display more specimens than you can monitor. Try and display basic information for all your specimens. Have takeaways, and especially for you folks, I've got a takeaway here that says, I touched a meteorite at AHSP 2018. And encourage photos of your audience members interacting with meteorites. And don't be surprised if an attendee claims to experience spiritual energy from a meteorite specimen. It does happen. Recommended reading, the Norton and Chitwood book. There's an e-magazine called Meteorite Times, free. And you can even check my meteorite page on my website, deepskyobserver.space slash meteorites. Not so you'll learn so much from my page, so I've got links to people who really know stuff. So, do you forgive me, audience? <laughs> if you watch the debate show, we forgive you. <laughs> Happy collecting.
Thank you. And how much time do we have? Okay, t questions and also for checking on the, oh, by the way, one of the good things that a, some vendors will provide are certificates of authenticity. And I have one here to show an example of what one might look like. Can yes. I, can I interrupt you for just a second? Yes. If anyone in here is going on the Green Bank Observatory tour, the group for that is forming out, up out near the tree on the deck right now. So you want to go join them in case you want to organize a carpool. That's all. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, sir. Okay. Yeah, uh, Becca. What's your favorite um, meteorite personally that you have collected? That's a tough one, and I'll tell you the story of a, of a good friend of mine who is a meteorite collector's collector, because he's got a collection that would put mine to shame, because his good, one of his very good buddy is also a meteorite dealer, so he does very, very well. But uh, when you ask him what his favorite meteorite is, he'll always tell you, my next one. And I can see why that was, because you have a, a lot of favorites, you know. It's almost like asking, what's the most important part of your car, the engine or the wheels, you know? It's like... Now, I'll, I'll one. Who does the classification and certification? The Meteoritical Society's uh, NOMCOM, and so a Nomenclature Committee. It's a mostly they're yeah they're mostly acad yeah academics uh, for the most part uh, uh, that uh, meteoriticists people who specialize in this stuff so they're members of the meteoritical society and typically they are the people like that are like the curators at uh, you know at uh, let's say Arizona State or where they have other big collections you know that are part of that as well as uh, other places around the world yes. Yeah, and, and, and there used to not be. It used to be the, the um, there were like some universities, University of Washington, and I can think of a few other places that would say, yeah, just send it to us and we'll, we'll check it out for you, whatever. But uh, since hazardous materials started getting sent through the mail, uh, that is, you know, not quite as encouraged anymore. And so as a result, uh, there may be a cost. And so uh, you have to inquire. And some of the... Uh, websites uh, that uh, you'll find in at least my web page uh, will tell you some more about uh, uh, where you can get your meteorites tested. In your experience with uh, uh, displaying and showing meteorite samples to uh, the visitors, um, do you include um, any kind of historical um, uh, background to understanding that they are uh, extraterrestrial, and do you find, if you do, do you find that that helps people appreciate their significance? Not sure. Again, I, I, there's a whole left of, raft of hidden slides I have here that uh, there's some that talk about the history and that sort of stuff, and I specifically left those off to keep this shorter, as well as to talk more about the collection side. Um, but I do talk a bit about that to say that people uh, from uh, the ancient Greeks, uh, there was a fellow named Diogenes, who um, was the first to really suggest that meteorites came from outer space. Um, but that it took a while before the science to really get to that point where they would admit it. Uh, and it was, uh, you have guys like Claudney, and, uh, and uh, Howard and those types of guys who did um, uh, work on characterizing a lot of these things to make sure, to indicate that, hey, there's not any earth rocks that have the same types of compositions. And then finally it took a, a, a French uh, scientist who was sent on a mission to investigate a fall, B.O., to actually investigate a fall having a sample of a recent fall with him and uh, to say these are really from outer space. Here's why if it came from outer space, it would have this strewn field, this, this certain type of pattern. Everybody would tell the same story and he wrote it up so elegantly that it was very convincing. What I do tell people, as I mentioned to you earlier, is that uh, one of the things I tell young people is that uh, this is a, a very uh, good case that 
even if you're, you want to study science or things related to science, that you really need a good background in English or whatever your language is because to be a scientist and not be able to express your ideas and get them out there and accepted won't do you much good. Yes, Richard. Yeah, I've noticed that the meteorite um, sellers have gravitated to star parties and the star party at Green Bank, which is normally around the 4th of July weekend, they, every year they have a meteorite collector. They, they have a raffle and also I was there and he had a class. We each got a, a metal meteorite and we got to process it with to preserve it. It's a slice. So you may, if you go to other star parties, be aware that there are guys, sometimes there are two different vendors there. So that's a place to, to enjoy it or even buy. Are there organizations uh, or groups that can introduce you to meteorite hunting? Hmm. That seems to be more of a individual or I wanted to say a, a small group type thing rather than a large group type thing. So uh, you can, um, there's a, a fellow who wrote a book, uh, Jeff Notkin, who wrote a whole book on, because you remember Meteorite Men, the, the series on TV. Uh, he was, uh, there, there was a, a reality-based TV series called Meteorite Men, and it was on, it just, again, had a cameraman follow these meteorite hunters to North Africa and wherever else, and, uh, and, and find this stuff. And so he's written a book uh, about meteorite hunting. Uh, last name, uh, is, uh, I believe it's Jeff with a G, G-E-O-F-F, -F, and last name is Notkin, N-O-T-K-I-N. <laughs> I mean, you, you have old Richard Norton's book, uh -huh. and he was one of the, the, the leader, leaders of this, this group based at Griffith Observatory. Uh, all the students of, uh, of um, uh, th this guy at, uh, at UCLA, who is a, a, a avid uh, meteorite, meteorite type person, and it was a very competitive yep. group. If you want to get a flavor for that, too, check the Meteorite uh, Times mag e magazine. Meteorite Times. Meteorite Times.com. Meteorite that e magazine, they have uh, articles on various aspects of uh, meteoritics and the industry and all parts. So you can read things about thin slices, about tektites, about what it's like to hunt for meteorites, uh, what it's like to collect special meteorites, what it's like to go to a, a mineral show. That's like the big show is in Tucson, the one in the United States anyway. And uh, so there's lots of uh, uh, details about what that's like, where you go from uh, hotel room to hotel room, and these guys with, you know, uh, probably six figures worth of meteorites to, to purchase and display or where the, uh, the wholesalers go and buy bunches so that they can resell and that sort of stuff. So you get a real good flavor of that as well as meteorite hunting. So there's a guy named uh, Jim Tobin, and uh, T-O-B-I-N, and he's actually written several books about uh, Canyon Diablo, Meteor Crater. And so uh, he, I would think he... He's not a academic, but uh, he was kind of an authority, and he does go on meteorite hunting expeditions to look for things, not only, not, not there, because that's private property, but in, in public property uh, lands in California or Nevada desert or something like that. No, Smithsonian Natural History. Yes, that's right. But natural history has the huge collection. Uh, and uh, that's also where when meteorites are found from Antarctica on their annual collecting, that they are, most of them get passed through there for uh, testing and classification. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, big time. And as a matter of fact, if you ever get a chance, that would be a, that's a nice tour to go on. And uh, just one thing, though, if you want to buy meteorites, the purchase of them is con con 
is uh, controlled by Smithsonian Enterprises. And Smithsonian Enterprises has decided that the, from what I was last aware of, anyway, that uh, meteorites can be sold at Air and Space Museum, not at Natural History, which is where the big collection is. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so if you, you want, if you, you can actually go to the main gift shop at Air and Space, go up to the second floor, and under a, a case, you'll find both uh, meteorites in Riker mounts as well as in, in jewelry for sale. And they're common meteorites at a reasonable price. So you can go there and do some purchasing. You can buy expensive geodes at Natural History, but no meteorites. Go figure. Understanding chemistry uh, was to get them fresh before they uh, were weathered. How tainted by 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 uh, the Earth's mm -hmm. surface, and that was a fascinating program. Out of that, the Lost City uh, meteor uh, was was uh, recovered. Do you? Um, I don't think you have any in your. Uh, the question is. Uh, yeah, that uh, that I don't know, but I will tell you that I do have uh, uh, pieces of Tagish Lake, yeah. which is another one that ha was a relatively recent fall. These are c types of com carbonaceous chondrites that are like charcoal briquettes, so they're very friable, and so uh, I've got a small piece of one of those, so... There is a more recent one that is uh, sort of in that flavor. It's called Almohada Siddha. And that one fell over Sudan. And they acquired pieces relatively quickly. They were surprised in a couple of ways, because first of all, it was the first one that they'd seen before it hit. So they'd actually saw it out in space as, a, as a, an asteroid with a 2000, whatever it is, designation. And so uh, there's that. And then to find it, depending on which piece that you've got, it was classified differently. So some pieces classified as a urolite, some pieces classified as a chondrite. And so that was a, another big revelation that you could have more than one type in this, this object. And so again, that's still, the, the pieces of that are pretty expensive too because of the uh, and recently, they found evidence in the urolite samples that uh, of certain c uh, characteristics of the early solar system that they could deduce from that. So that's from Almohada Siddha. Uh, so the other one, uh, one that fa fell relatively recently that's just started to come on the marketplace is what's called the Hamburg meteorite. Not because it's related to anything you eat, but it fell over south eastern Michigan in a place called Hamburg Township. And again, that was one where the AMS saw the, you know, the, uh, the people who watch for meteors and, and plot them out. And so they plotted them out, they triangulated on the ground to figure out where they, where they likely uh, strewn field was, this is where you find meteorites is at the strewn field. And so they went out there and people did find some pieces. Since it's new and it was in the news, it's pretty pricey. So that fell in, in mid-January, and, and pieces have started to hit the marketplace. <laughs> but they're not, but believe it or not, believe it or not, they, they're mostly, people will say that they're not all that warm. 
because most of them will explode in the air and then fall at a lower speed. And even so, considering that they've been in the deep freeze for however many millennia, and just have their outer shell just toasted a bit before, for, for what, maybe three seconds before they hit the ground, so. Yes? I have actually, that's another hidden set of slides here that I have. Uh, the, the way the ice sheet moves is it moves from the interior towards the coast. And so uh, towards the coast, they will, they will gravitate towards certain mountain ranges or hill ranges there. And what happens is the ice sheet creeps up. The top layer of the ice then starts to sublime or ablate off due to the winds. And guess what's exposed? Meteorites are exposed. So it acts almost like a conveyor belt of meteorites. And every year they collect boatloads of this stuff and they come through either Japan studies or whoever else goes and, and United States teams goes through the Natural History Museum eventually. Tim, yeah, yeah, Tim, yep, I met him. Yeah, but uh, uh, Henderson was, was um, very critical of Whipple's uh, meteoriticis uh, because Whipple wanted to keep the, the meteor samples. But Henderson said, no, they should go to natural history because Whipple was not running a museum. So, you know, now, now you're telling me about the SE stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, So anyway, I want to thank everybody for attending for these great questions and, uh, you know, especially uh, those who have provided additional information, David Dvorkin as well. And again, uh, you can come up and those that are out, you can feel free to pick up and examine. And again, if you want, you can even take uh, your, your selfie with them and uh, you can take a I touched a meteorite at HSP card. Thank you.